What's going on everybody? This is DK Dynamite and today I have a massive zombies video. We're going to be talking about the storyline behind future DLC maps in Black Ops Cold War Zombies. We're also going to be talking about cut content from D-Machina that could still be used in the future and we're also going to be recapping the entire D-Machina storyline for anybody out there that is still confused as to what's going on in this Dark Aether spinoff. Definitely stay tuned but before you jump into that be sure to hit that subscribe button down below because about 80% of you that watch my videos aren't subscribed. So make sure you guys are getting notifications every time I update you on Black Ops Cold War. Now also be sure to use code DYNAMITE if you want to save 10% off your Control Freak order. Their link is also down below in the description. So just to make things very clear here, nobody out there knows the order of the DLC maps for Black Ops Cold War Zombies. We do know thanks to several teasers in the D Machina intro, some ciphers and intel that the locations that we should be going to include somewhere in Vietnam near Khe Sanh. We propose that to be Firebase Z. We have another location near the Ural Mountains, which is by Mount Yemental, WMD, Summit, those kind of vibes. We also know about Berlin, which is set to take place very close to where Kiener der Toten is, the theater that is, and the building right outside of that. And we've also heard quite a bit about some type of Germany-style map, some type of giant Derice remake. Not too sure about that one just yet, but we'll probably hear more about that in future maps. So, with that being said, there is quite a bit of evidence that does support that Vietnam, Firebase Z is probably the first map we'll be going to in the DLC season, but again, nothing is definitive whatsoever, just to make that clear. Now, we also have quite a bit of cut content from D-Machina, which I think still has a fairly strong chance of popping up in future DLC maps. Now, if nothing does, it's a bit disappointing, because some of this content is fairly damn exciting. Now, to start off simple, we have a tutorial mode. So, I guess you could say similar to Black Ops 4 Zombies, that game had a tutorial mode, that ended up being canceled for Black Ops Cold War, which I don't think is that much of a problem since they kind of merged a tutorial mode into the core gameplay of the Machina since it does guide you in turning on the power anyway and of course getting Pack-a-Punch, so I think that's fine. But we of course have a cut Nocturne and Toten survival map, which has also been rumored to actually be releasing throughout Season 1 at some point, which I think is fair. So we might end up having a brand new Zombies experience every other season, but then in between that, we can get some standard alone survival maps just there for gameplay and replayability which I don't have a problem with but it was originally rumored that you could have unlocked this Nocturne Totem survival map through finishing the D-Machina easter egg possibly even just beating the campaign that was of course a rumor at one point now we also have the Ray Rifle which we've talked about before I still think this has a strong chance of popping up one day we do know back in Classified within Black Ops 4 there were blueprints of a Ray Gun Mark 4 and Mark 5 which we never saw those could have been the scrapped wonder weapons for Alpha Mega, who actually knows, but there was a Ray Rifle that was supposed to pop up at some point in D-Machina. There's even a calling card with a suspicious looking Ray Gun, so that could have been it, but maybe they just changed their mind about that and said, you know what, we're gonna go with the Die Shockwave instead. Now, there was of course that very interesting image that popped up of somebody's after-action report which displayed the Die Shockwave as some type of purifier, hellfire from Black Ops 4. It had a bit of a green tint to it, so people out there assumed that that could have been some type of placeholder image for a Ray Rifle. That's of course unconfirmed as well, but I think at some point in the future, a Ray Rifle would make some type of sense. And, you know, with that being said too, we had something about a Nikolai Glove. Now, not sure what role that would have played in the Machina, but I think at one point in time, they did want to throw in a couple of Easter eggs regarding Primus and Ultimus, which I think makes sense, but they might want to save that for a future DLC as well. Not sure what his glove would have been for, like I said, but I think to see nostalgia like that in the future would mean a lot to hardcore storyline fans. There were also more tier upgrades for perks and some of the field upgrade specialists, so I think that is very simple to see at some point in the future. Right now we only have, what is it, three upgrades per perk and per field upgrade. You can very well see more maybe in the DLC season to allow us to do more with our Ethereum crystals. That wouldn't shock me whatsoever or those extra upgrades could in fact be scrapped because they don't want us to be too overpowered when we play Black Ops Cold War Zombies. Now, here's one of the big ones with Steiner, of course a major character from the Black Ops 1 campaign. We of course got a teaser of him in the original D-Machina teaser after the multiplayer reveal. They showed him for a split second and I'm like that had to have been for a reason. We of course get several references to him throughout the Black Ops Cold War campaign. A phenomenal story by the way and if you guys are confused about what happened throughout the Black Ops Cold War campaign I have my storyline breakdown video down below in the description but Steiner didn't play any type of role in D-Machina as we thought he would but funny enough and don't tell anybody 
I told you, but Orlov, the character that we do interact quite a bit with in the Easter egg, is referenced as Steiner in the files of the game. So with that being said, at one point, I think Orlov may have actually just been Steiner, and for whatever reason, they did a character swap. Who knows why that was? Hopefully they're saving Steiner for a future DLC map. I think he would be a great villain in a Zombies experience, without a doubt, but if he doesn't pop up in the future, then it's unfortunate that his role in D-Machina just never saw a light of day. Again, I'm really crossing my fingers for this one because that sounds like a really rich connection from campaign to zombies. Now, we also know there was some type of Panzer Mecha and some type of jetpack in D-Machina at one point. Could Steiner have been some type of mini boss like a Mangler slash Panzer? That is also a possibility, but there was definitely going to be some type of other mini boss or heavy enemy, I should say, over on D-Machina. That, of course, didn't happen either. And when it comes to a jetpack, I'm not sure if we would have built it and flew it ourselves. Could it have been some type of East Easter egg exclusive item that was kind of like the Dark Ether Wrench, something that's just there that we need for some reason, maybe even something like the decontamination device that we have to pick up during the Easter egg. Could have been something exclusive like that or some leftover asset altogether. Who knows what that would have been for. Now, there was also talk about alternate endings, and I know my buddy The Gaming Revolution made a very banger video talking just about these alternate endings, but yeah, at one point in time, the Machina may have been extremely similar to Final Reich, which further proves that Yes, at one point, Such Hammer and Raven were going ham on this zombie's experience before Treyarch took over and turned this into a Dark Aether spinoff. Such Hammer was doing quite a bit similar to what they did with Final Reich. I mean, considering Final Reich was a successful map, they really wanted to have the Machina or whatever the map was called originally to have alternate endings, this giant monster type of boss, as it seems, and some other cool mechanics that we also saw in World War II. Now, it's a good transition point to what that giant monster is, this elder god that lurks in the woods woods throughout the Machina. It's of course been reported thanks to the model of the Elder God that got ripped that the actual model of the Elder God is filled with several different bodies. So I wonder what is actually the deal behind this Elder God, right? It looks extremely similar to the Panzer Mortar. I think that's what you called it from the Final Reich. I know TGR also made a banger video talking about how Victus could very well be stuck within this giant Elder God-like creature. That is definitely a very strong theory with quite a bit of evidence too, considering a lot of things in the Dark Aether do merge together. We have the Wonder Fizz machine that is kind of this big mashup of classic perks as well. So if that ends up being the case and Victus are stuck on this giant Elder God, it's a big question as to whether or not we can save them. Do we have to kill this beast, which would kill them in the process? Who knows what the deal is with this Elder God, whether he was a planned boss fight at one point, or maybe he's being saved for a future map and they're just teasing him over in the woods on the Machina. Lots of questions to be asked when it comes to this beast, but I think with alternate endings of the Machina, I would have loved to see a little bit more on that, right? Final Right kind of did it with this casual ending and hardcore ending, but it turns out that hardcore ending was the canon one and the casual one just wasn't. And I was hoping Sledgehammer would have doubled down on that throughout their DLC season, but they just didn't. They just did it one time and then never did it again. I was hoping Treyarch would kind of reform that alternate ending system. Maybe they will in the future, but with the Machina, they definitely didn't dip their toes something like that. And I I get why. Maybe it was a bit too confusing to have more than one ending. They'd have to choose which one is canon. Or maybe all endings could have just dealt with a different part of the story and then all ended the same with the Xville. They could have done something with that. But also, when it comes to the future of the storyline, I will say Eddie is inevitable. And I have heard a couple of whispers about there being Eddie intel somewhere out there. I'm not going to talk about it until the community ends up seeing what I'm talking about. I don't want to spoil anything major. But Eddie's inevitable. And I think uh, in a future DLC match, both Samantha and Eddie should be playing some type of a large role with what's going on. I mean, there'll be callbacks to the past. Who knows if Nolan North will voice the new version of Eddie. I think if they recast Eddie himself, it would technically make sense considering that uh, this is a different version of quote-unquote Rick Toffin now in this new universe, not the same one from the past. So, I mean, a lot of things they could do with that, but the fact that they still have the same voice actors for Samantha kind of tells me that, yeah, Nolan North would work just fine as Eddie in this Dark Aether spinoff, but let's just see what happens with what Activision decides to do regarding these voice actors. Now, I also want to stress that a very easy plot point that Craig Houston could go with in the future is having Stuhlinger being stuck in Eddie's head to kind of haunt him, even though Eddie isn't the reason why things went down the way they did in Tag. That was a different Rick Toffin, but would be a very funny flip flop to see, and I think Craig Houston has at least thought of that once by now, right, in terms of how you bring Victus back in the future. They could do nothing with Victus at all in the future. They could just kill him off or have a cipher that says, yeah, they were in Dark Aether, and then they just 
just died off or got mutated with a zombie or something and that's it. He could do that too, but I think Eddie and Stulinger could play a very interesting role together as one almost at some point in the future of the storyline. Now, I think what is a problem though as of right now with Black Ops Cold War Zombies is that a lot of the story is being told through intel, through ciphers, as opposed to what we're used to from Black Ops 3 and 4 where a lot of the story is told through cutscenes and actual big events during some of the Easter eggs. They scaled all that back with their new game, which I think is fine. It goes back to the roots of what Zombies is all about, learning the story through radios, intel, ciphers, regardless of how much budget is put into the map. They can still put a lot of rich story into a map without really conveying it in this cinematic form, as we've been used to for the past couple of years now. So, with that being said, a lot of people out there really don't know what happened in the D-Machina storyline, which we'll get to in a minute. But now when it comes to ciphers and intel that tease future DLC maps, first and foremost, we have quite a bit of intel and ciphers when it comes to Vietnam, or I should say Firebase Z. One of them says, Attention K, P confirms viability of deployment. Opportunity identified in previous commune unique. Selected site is approved for trial run of Operation Inversia. I'm not sure what that says, but a bit of a typo. The nature of warfare is about to transform. Any mission, any time, any place, G. So in terms of who K, P, and G are, we had to look at who we have in campaign. We have K for Kravchenko, P for Perseus, and G for Gorbachev. Now, it could be different characters entirely, but considering this huge campaign connection, with Black Ops Cold War Zombies, would not be surprised to see someone like Kravchenko play a very large role in a future DLC map, considering we have this rivalry going. Weaver versus Kravchenko. Kravchenko is the one that originally took Weaver's eye out, so I think seeing Requiem and Omega go at it would be inevitable for a future map. So can't wait to see that. We also have a report from November 17th, 1983 from Moscow, Operasia Redacted, author Dr. William Peck. So the background here is 16th of August, Operation Undertaker is given formal approval to be carried out by Special Operations Group Omega. November 1st, Operation Undertaker is completed. Dimensional gateways open around the world, including one near the Huang Ho District of Quang Tri Province. Probably completely butchered that, excuse me. Socialist Republic of Vietnam. On November 8th, Chairman Chek Brakov <laughs> comes to an agreement with Chairman Pham Van Dong to construct a KGB Specknaz Omega Group facility outside district capital, Quezon. November 9th, approval is given for Operation Redacted to be carried out by Special Operations Group Omega. November 11th, construction begins for your Omega Group site near Quezon that is presumably going to be Firebase Z. Now, we also have a mission status. Omega Group Operations Site secured near Quezon on November 11th. Cover story about recently discovered U.S. chemical weapon being accidentally detonated as successfully resonated throughout the community. Site construction has begun with completion anticipated by February 15th. The Colonel has expressed interest in using site to begin testing on Redacted. Additionally, Operation Redacted will focus on testing with Redacted, all these Redacteds here, formal uh, requests to begin curating volunteers for experimentation has been submitted. Pending approval, expect our first full report before March. Dr. William Peck, Exo Scientific Phenomena Research Lead, for the Omega group. So a lot, when it comes to Vietnam, that's why I'm like, if Vietnam isn't DLC 1, I'd be shocked considering how much they already dropped in game teasing that map. I have a video also going really in depth with Firebase Z, an actual first person view of what the map could look like thanks to a glitch. That video will of course be linked down below in the description, but we do actually have a cipher when it comes to the Ural Mountains map. So whatever map we're gonna end up seeing near Mount Yemental, the map near WMD or Summit, whatever the map looks like, it says, Attention K, initial survey of Ural site verifies it is by far the largest incursion zone yet recorded. We must assume Requiem will detect it via satellite and deploy fire teams regardless of sovereign borders. Recommend continuing operations while monitoring Requiem communications. With your support, I will ensure any new gains remain in Soviet hands. Now, this is a Beaufort type cipher, and the key is actually Outbreak, which to me is interesting because I've heard quite a bit about Outbreak in the past. So here's my thoughts on this, right? If Euro Mountains doesn't end up being a Zombies map in the future, this is 100% a Zombies fire team experience. I mean, 
fire teams are mentioned in this cipher and the Ural Mountains again is near Mount Yemental, WMD, Summit. I could very well see that being a fire team map super easily but I would say because it's being a you know teaser in zombies this is probably a teaser for an actual zombies map but hey if this is a fire team experience for zombies I wouldn't complain either. Now with the key being outbreak I've heard that term being thrown around quite a bit in the community recently. I'm not sure if outbreak is another zombies mode. I'm not sure if it's a code name for zombies fire team. I'm not sure what that is, but I'm almost certain that Outbreak isn't the name of a future Zombies map. I mean, we kind of saw that in Exo Zombies already. When it comes to remakes, too, not to go off on a tangent, but when it comes to remakes, it's different when you have a new map that just incorporates an area of an old map versus just having an old map expanded upon. Those are two completely different things. The Black Ops 4 remake situation, you had the classic maps, of course, recreated with a couple of new areas outside of what we were familiar with. But D Machina is not that situation at all. D Machina is a brand new map that just happens to have knocked in one of the areas right it's not even the spawn you know you spawn right outside of knock not in it but it's like saying that transit is a knocked remake as well when transit's a brand new map stands on its own feet but there's just knocked in the cornfield somewhere it's that simple so if they stick with that for the dlc maps it shouldn't be that much of a problem now to properly end off this video we're gonna go ahead and recap the entire storyline thus far for black ops cold war zombies with the machina but keep in mind there isn't much footage to actually illustrate a lot of what's happened with the storyline thus far since most of the story has been found and understood through ciphers radios and some intel now we do however have the spectral ghost easter egg here on the map which could help visualize some of the things that we are going to be talking about and it's definitely worth understanding the story behind D Machina just so you guys are better prepared for whatever story they have in mind for some future DLC maps. Now shout out to Cal Jitsu for helping me script this part of the video. His link will also be down below in the description. Now in 1938 the world's history was forever changed. In Berlin in the buildings of the Kaiser Wilhelm Society for Chemistry, Germany's brightest minds discovered how to split the atom and in turn release incredible amounts of energy. In a world on the brink of War, the Reich took note of this discovery, and so the Uranium Club was born. Chaired by Dr. Kurt Deibner, the so-called Uranium Club was the Reich's foremost research organization for the study of atomic and subatomic science. In turn, this could be utilized for the benefit of Germany, of course, through weaponry. By 1944, more progress was needed in this field, and so the Uranium Club contacted a Dr. Ulrich Vogel, a brilliant mind in the still-emerging field of quantum physics, and and a loyal citizen of the fatherland. Dr. Vogel, alongside his most trusted assistant, Dr. Kurtz, submit plans to the Uranium Club for a new facility, one that would greatly advance the Reich's atomic research program using a cyclotron, a particle accelerator nicknamed the Atom Smasher by some, and after careful consideration, the club approved this new facility, though under the caveat that Vogel must first and foremost pursue atomic development rather than his own desires to further the field of quantum physics. Upon this agreement, the facility was Christian Project End Station and is built underneath a German bunker in occupied Poland. On March 7th of the same year, Dr. Vogel is on track to conduct his 12th cyclotron test. As Kurt's powers on the machine, all seems well until suddenly the system begins to fail. At the same moment, strange manifestations begin occurring in the air around the device. Screaming at Kurtz to cut the power, the two men flee into the safety of the rest of the facility, seeing that the soldiers in close proximity to the cyclotron had been zombified. Vogel orders that the former soldiers be sealed in. Five days later, having analyzed the situation, Dr. Vogel begins to understand this event wasn't a setback, but a breakthrough, not only in science, but a literal breakthrough to a new reality. To gather initial data, the scientists at End Station fed data collecting devices through on a long metal pole, staying far enough away to not be transformed by the rift. It should be noted at this point that a scientist in the employ of the end station was one Dr. Oscar Strauss. 40 years later, he would tell Grigory Weaver that he knew nothing of the dimensional experiments occurring at End Station. However, given that it was virtually the only research occurring at the facility, this seems to be a lie. Weeks go by with constant new discoveries. First and foremost, Vogel recognizes that what caused the men to change is a new kind of element. He dubs it Exo Element 1, or Ethereum. So, this is essentially the new version of 115, or the Dark Ether equivalent of what 115 was in the original Ether story. 
So back then, 115 was a battery for ethereal energy, whereas Ethereum here is a battery for dark ethereal energy. It's noted that this is completely alien to our world, and furthermore, it can be used as a vast energy source, and Station begins producing a collector for this exo element, one that is capable of extracting it from range from zombies and inanimate objects alike. However, during one of the tests, a young scientist accidentally discharges the machine, sending Vogel's car flying. At this, and Station recognizes the potential of this not as a tool, but as a weapon, renaming the project the Decompressive Isotopic Estrangement Device, or DIE. More importantly, Vogel also conceives of a machine that could be capable of healing the soldiers who have been necrotized by their exposure to Ethereum. During initial testing, Kurtz refers to the machine as Der Wechsler, or the Changer, despite Vogel pointing out that they are not changing the men, but restoring them. More time passes, and by August, with the loss of Normandy, Hitler himself begins to see the potential of End Station's work, specifically that of Der Wechsler, I can't even speak, Der Wechsler, excuse me, and the notion of a controllable undead army. However, the Allied advance was too swift, and the findings of End Station can never be implemented. Or at least, that's how it appears. Intel we find within the map reveals that the Reichstag had entrusted Vogel with a plan to open a third front within World War II. Germany's first front was to the west with Europe. The second front was to the east with Russia. It appears that this third front is the Dark Aether itself. As the Allies advance, both Vogel and Kurtz, who by this point had become inseparable, make plans to initiate the machine one final time. It is unknown what fate that they met. However, given the Reichstag's plan, it is entirely possible that the two were able to successfully escape into the Dark Aether. We do learn, however, that a single scientist did escape the facility during this event, later making an unsuccessful attempt to sneak back in. The identity of the scientist is unknown, though given Oscar Strauss is still alive by the 1980s, he may have in fact been the culprit. With the Red Army almost at the facility, it is now overrun by zombies due to the cycle Latron's activation, only one soldier remained, named Walter. Taking one of the dies, he hides in the bunker at the surface of the facility, behind a locked door, eventually dying of starvation. That's of course the door we open to get the free die wonder weapon. One week after the facility's abandonment, the Soviet's 8 Guards Division, led by Colonel Lazarev, reached the facility. With the majority of the unit initially preoccupied, two men, Alexei Dmitry and Vadim Kalashnik, enter the upper levels of the facility, locating the solid gold housing of Der Wechsler's decontamination agent. Seeing that it would likely fetch a small fortune, the two hide it atop a tree before journeying down into the facility once again with their unit. This time, Kalashnik ensures his camera is rolling and captures on film the first contact with the cyclotron. The unit is immediately attacked by undead Nazis, that's a tape that was shown at the intro cutscene for the Machina, and one week later, Lazarev returns with the 1st Guards Tank Division. It is here that Kazimir Zakov volunteers to enter End Station and shut off the machine. Zakov is the man in the gas mask seen in the intro cutscene for the Machina. With great effort, Zakov is able to shut off this gate to hell saying that he has one last idea. He loads his weapon and runs headfirst into the Dark Aether. His fate, however, is unknown. By 1981, the Cold War had reached a standstill. Desperately searching for any way to break the deadlock, a new division is formed within the KGB. They are known as the Omega Group, and their aim is to research what some would deem paranormal phenomena and topics at the very fringes of accepted science. At virtually the same time, the CIA assembles its own new division for a similar purpose known as Requiem. Uncovering information about the Soviet discovery of End Station in the 40s, Omega Group believed that whatever housed there could be the very weapon that they need in order to finally win the Cold War. Among those dispatched to the now declarate End Station are Dr. Valentina and Dr. Peck, the latter of which is a defector from the United States, both sent to oversee the scientific goings at End Station alongside a slew of Omega Group soldiers, two of which are Orlov and Medvedev. When it comes time to activate the machine, once again, Orlov and Medvedev are volunteered to be the ones to enter the bunker and initiate the device. Though they are not told what will happen to them afterwards, Medvedev is transfixed by the glory that awaits them, believing they will become heroes of the Soviet Union. However, Orlov is not convinced, much more concerned for his family. Succeeding in their mission, the two men are corrupted by the Dark Aether. It is likely that Orlov becomes the Megaton. However, the fate of Medvedev is unknown, though he is a possible candidate for the identity of the Mayak. 
the other Megaton that spawns only in the Dark Aether. Learning that Omega Group are up to something in Poland, Rogue B and the agent Samantha Maxis makes contact with the Field Ops Director of Requiem, Gregory Weaver, and explains the situation, along with sending him the videotape of the facility created by Kalashnik 40 years prior. Disturbed at the details within, Weaver asks Sam to rendezvous for extraction, where she can be safe in the West, but she refuses, believing she still has more to do. Over the coming days, works begin to manifest in a variety of locations throughout the world, causing necrotization of all in the area, leading to Requiem having to perform rapid containment operations, and eventually, the decision is made to send a strike team to Morosco, Poland to end station. By the time the strike team reached the site, the Omega Group has already left, guided by Weaver, along with Dr. Gray, a British scientist focusing on unexplained phenomena and unnatural science, Major Carver, a respected and feared soldier, and Dr. Oscar Strauss, the very same Strauss who worked at the end station 40 years ago. The the team make their way through the facility until they reach the cyclotron. Initiating what at first seems like a dormant device, they realize that it is actually still operating at full power, able to effortlessly manifest a rift to the Dark Aether. As the strike team slowly pieced together what happened at the facility, Weaver is relayed new orders from the director of Requiem, whose identity is currently unknown to us, they must contain the dimensional breach. Without the technical knowledge to work the cyclotron, the team utilizes Dr. Vexler, still operational at the facility, in order to bring back Orla. Love. Initially angered and scared, he is convinced to help them after seeing a photograph of his family. After protecting Orlov and fending off waves of the undead, he tells the strike team that they must flee the site immediately, and after reaching extraction just in time, End Station is destroyed in a colossal explosion. Whilst the cyclotron was successfully destroyed, the sudden appearance of rifts throughout the world and the lack of any Omega Group presence at the site likely means they were able to achieve whatever goal they came for, and as a result, have put the fate of the world in jeopardy. As Requiem try to piece together the past and the coming maps, humanity's future will be in their hands.